Today, we welcome uh, Dr. Mohamed Hamadi, CEO of Amanat Holdings. Uh, Amanat is listed on the Dubai financial market and as an investment company focused on healthcare and education in the GCC. Prior to becoming CEO, Dr. Hamadi, uh, who holds uh, a research fellowship certificate in ENT surgery from Harvard Medical School, was Amanat's CIO, and he has a wealth of knowledge in education and healthcare. So welcome, uh, Dr. Mohammed. Happy to have you with us today. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. And you can call me Mohammed. Okay, Mohammed. So uh, Amanat just recently announced its first uh, VC investment in an ed tech company. So could you please explain to us uh, how this investment came about and uh, the importance of it and the reasons for this choice in particular? Sure, with pleasure. So, as, as you know, Khaled, Amanat is, is an investor in education and healthcare. So, we're a specialized investor uh, in the MENA region. Historically, we've been focusing our investments on uh, hospitals uh, when it intersects with, with the healthcare sector and uh, universities and school under education. I think what, what we have realized is that technology has been disrupting both of these sectors quite significantly. While doing so, we felt it's, uh, it will complement the conventional offering. It will never be able to replace the conventional offering, but it will complement it. So while our average ticket size is usually $100 million per, per project in conventional healthcare and education, we felt Amanat could play a strategic role in the technology space when it intersects with education and healthcare. So health tech and ed tech are of uh, interest to us as of, as of very recent. Uh, and and the, the reason for that is we feel we, we will be play, positioned as a strategic partner to those technology companies in the MENA region by leveraging our own ecosystem of hospitals and schools and universities into those, those technologies. So it will be a win-win from, uh, from, from both sides. So this is a, a recent interest. Uh, I would tell you it was accelerated by COVID. So we've been thinking about that for a while, but it was accelerated by, uh, by, by COVID. And we've made the decision to enter that space. Uh, the way we are looking at this space is we're interested in companies, technology companies globally. So this will give us a global exposure to, uh, to, to investments. Uh, companies that are revenue generating, clear path to profitability, looking to grow and scale up in the MENA region, those would be the types of companies that we would be interested in. More, more specifically, if there's a role for our portfolio to play in, in scaling those, those technology companies. So uh, this, is, this is really the, the reason of why we entered that space. Begin was the first investment that we've made uh, in, in, into the space and I'm happy to talk to you through it. Great. So uh, I'll just uh, continue on this. Where do you see uh, this new tech and ed tech? Which, which part of the ed tech uh, beyond uh, the specifics of uh, uh, the stage in which the company is, uh, which specific part of the ed tech is most uh, interesting for, for you in that sense? So that's great. When, when you say ed tech, people think it's, uh, it's just online learning, right? Uh, ed tech is not that only. Uh, EdTech is, is digital learning tools, it's, uh, it's uh, school operation management systems, it's standardized examinations, it's digital curricula, all the way to gamification and, and edutainment. And, uh, and this is, this is EdTech to us, and we are interested across the board. We feel that the way uh, education in general has been dealt with and is being provided will, will change significantly over the coming years. We felt it in our own schools, in our own universities. We are currently offering hybrid learning models. We're currently looking at systems of how can we do a remote examination and how can I uh, do uh, integrate artificial intelligence into our uh, provision of, of education. And all of that space is extremely, extremely interesting. And we are interested across that value chain. Okay, so if we move on to uh, another uh, sector in which you invest and which is also impacted by tech, uh, which is healthcare, uh, where do you see the new opportunities, the innovation or the disruption happening in healthcare today? 
Well, in, in, in few words, I think you and I know, know healthcare as we have a certain medical condition, we go to the emergency room or we show up to a hospital and the future generations will know it as an application on the phone through which you can, you can, you can get more than 80% of the healthcare services that you require. Not only that, with better healthcare outcomes at a lower cost and much more accessibility and, and, and diversification of offerings beyond your immediate vicinity of, of a medical center or, or a hospital. So that's, that's in, 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 in brief how I think the, the healthcare sector will transition. Uh, the whole payment model will, will change. Today, you consume and you pay as you consume and the insurance company pays, pays the bill. Uh, I think that that will change. That will, that will, will, will be based on, on data uh, on data analytics that gets to know the patient very well and track the patient very well and push services to the patient and prevent medical conditions. And then whoever is providing any sort of service or even an equipment or a technology, it will be a value-based model that will compensate uh, the, the healthcare providers. Now, how does that translate into our interest in this sector? Well, I would tell you, what we know best is health tech and, and, and med tech. Uh, we, we're not looking at life sciences at the moment. Uh, we feel that we would like to play in, in this uh, cycle of telemedicine, home diagnostics, uh, chronic disease management, um, e-pharma, and, and, and that space. Uh, because we feel that that space is actually a very integrated space. Today, it's completely disintegrated. And there are several offerings in the market, but none of them is a fully integrated model that allows for a full journey of a, a patient. Uh, and, and, and this is where, where we're interested in. And we're building a very strong pipeline in, in each of these uh, verticals in, in the health tech space. So as you build your pipeline, how do MENA-based startups in these two sectors fare up with the co global competition? Uh, what is your, your, your opinion on, about that? That's, that's an interesting one. Um, regionally, there are a few interesting plays, actually. Uh, not many, but a but few interesting ones. Our lens is to approach this from a global perspective uh, by, by identifying the winners in the global market, be it the US or the UK or Canada or, or other jurisdictions, that have shown uh, or demonstrated their ability to succeed in those markets and proven track record and try to scale them up into the region. Now, that doesn't mean that our current pipeline does not include, actually it does include regional players that we are in discussions with. Uh, the interesting thing about those players is their current market positioning. They have a first mover advantage. They've established themselves in the market and, and that has a value. And, and we look at that uh, in lieu of, of also the, uh, the, the, the backbone on the technical backbone of the global companies and, and their reach. Most of the R&D has been invested in global companies. Uh, many of the local companies were, uh, were, were either a copy of what's out there or some of them invented themselves from here and learned a lot from what's happening around the globe. So Amanat is positioned to benefit from both. Um, but we're not restricted to the local market. Okay, so you, ha you have three verticals clearly defined in your investment uh, uh, thesis. Which, which one of these three do you see has the most uh, uh, potential now with post-pandemic or during this pandemic uh, that has accelerated everything? Which one do you, do you have put the most focus on now? We, we invest in healthcare and, and education, as you know, and the third vertical that you're alluding to is the, uh, the social infrastructure, which is the real estate of healthcare and education. So technically, it's still an exposure into the healthcare and education sectors. Uh, if we learned anything from COVID, it was one of the biggest tests, in, I think, in the history of, of each of our, our experiences, into how resilient are those sectors really. And the result was they're quite resilient uh, as compared to other sectors. 
right? While healthcare in the initial phases of COVID was impacted, it wasn't impacted because it's healthcare. It was impacted because there was a curfew from the governments and there were, there were restrictions to provide uh, non-emergency procedures, which has impacted all healthcare operations in the region. But I can tell you very quickly, within two months, uh, starting end of June, uh, the, the J curve and the bounce back uh, was, was there. So we have bounced back in healthcare quite strongly. Uh, in some of our hospitals, we've shown numbers stronger than pre-COVID numbers, uh, mainly due to a backlog, but also due to our digitization of our services and our ability to reach a wider patient population. So healthcare has proven to be quite, quite resilient. Education, to my surprise, honestly, was also very, very resilient. Uh, what, 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 what we have seen in our schools and our universities is if you have a platform that is sizable, that is multiple assets, so it's quite diversified and it has good quality and it's offering services at a good value for money, you have the ability to, to succeed in such a market. Our enrollments have went up in our school group in Talim and, and so it did in, uh, in, in one of our universities. More interestingly, in one of the universities, which is Middlesex University, we get transnational students from outside the, the UAE. We expected those to be nil, given airports are closed, visas are not being issued and what have you. And we actually managed to sign up more than 80% of our target uh, through online learning for this September semester. Mm -hmm. So. In short, both ended being quite, quite resilient and we're optimistic about the, uh, the prospects of, of both healthcare and education, quite frankly. I mean, you, you, you've touched a point which is the uncertainty. I mean, we're seeing it in the market. If you look at the past uh, months, weeks, nobody really knows there's a lot of liquidity. You're a listed company, uh, so I'm sure you, you, you look at the stock markets. Do you see investors having to learn uh, to live with this uncertainty or do you see things uh, calming down and, and what would be the elements to calm down markets in the coming uh, period of time? So, so you're asking me if investors have learned to live. I'll tell you, investors have learned and they will live with it. So mm -hmm. we've learned a lot, uh, no question. But um, oddly enough, I'm personally quite optimistic about the, the future. I think uh, quite optimistic, but cautious. Uh, it's important to, to, to take a step back and really take a, an account of what have we learned from, from uh, the, the COVID experience ac across each of our companies. Uh, and I think we've emerged stronger than, than, than pre-COVID. We've learned how important corporate governance is. We've learned how important corporate strategy is. And, and having, having a really de well-defined corporate strategy that is agile, that is nimble, that's able to, to react, and having the right management teams in place and the right resources in place that allow you to really uh, uh, react to such extraordinary situations. And COVID is, is certainly one, one of those. So that helps me to tell you from, from a company perspective, I'm quite optimistic. At the same time, we have a strong balance sheet where we have around 472 million of, of cash and we are debt free. So our ability to, to really lead over the next 12 months during this, uh, this era is, is quite, quite you know, uh, strong. And, uh, and I think this will enable us to look at opportunities in both healthcare and education sectors and be able to look at M&As and, and roll-ups and, and, uh, and opportunities that we could merge with our existing companies and create platforms. Uh, and, and this is why I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. At the same time, more, more macro, while there are a lot of indicators that are, have limited visibility on, 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 on the next uh, six to 12 months, I also do believe that uh, very slowly you're seeing the economy going back to, to, to normalcy. And it's good to see business coming back. It's good to see advisors and consultants and investors really back in action and in discussions. And, and we are. 
and 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 that should eventually get the wheel the economic wheel turning back again and, and that's why i'm optimistic at the same time more from a even more macro uh, i think the governments uh, are, have been dealing with with the situation uh, quite well and are they learning as they go and the handling of the situation as it impacts the economy is becoming more and more efficient and and that gives us a bit of a positive outlook towards business will continue economy will 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 grow and we're in in the dubai market and in the uae market uh, and we invest in the mena mena region and we're quite uh, optimistic about uh, the uh, the prospects when you when you mention mna and the more acquisitions is it more on the let's say brick and mortar traditional side or more focused on the digital and merging them together I'm glad you asked this because I don't want to be misperceived as we will be investing 500 million in technology. No, okay. we're not saying that. Our core mandate, majority of our core mandate will continue to be private equity investments into hospitals and universities and schools and brick, what you're calling brick and mortar and what I call conventional investments. Because as I think we, we agreed at the beginning of this call, these will never be replaced. But in order for these to succeed, they need to, first of all, show scale, show uh, um, diversification, and they need to be leaders in the digitization or at least integrate data and digital into their model in order to continue to compete and, and sustain in the future. And this is directly... Uh, is implied on our investment thesis. We will invest maybe 90, 90, 95% of our capital into conventional and five to 10% into, into technology. This is, this is an ongoing strategy as, as we go, but that's how, how we view it at the moment. So, it, I mean, I guess my, so my last question was around work from home. So I guess I have part of the answer when it comes to uh, uh, schools and universities and, and hospitals. But when it comes to your business of doing investment, do, do, do you prefer this mix of work from home or you want to everybody back in the office as soon as possible? Well, I'll, I'll take that in twofold. One is as, as it relates to our operating model and whether, whether I will continue to fly for a half an hour meeting in Jeddah, which I used to do on a weekly basis. Uh, I don't think I'll be doing that again. Uh, unless really there's an absolute need. We've, we've realized that technology and, and look at our, our discussion now, it's, it's, it's quite easy and, 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 uh, and smooth and we don't need to be you know, in, in a physical room. Uh, so for those, I think we've learned a lot and that will have an impact on our operating model. When it comes to how we as a team and how we interact, uh, I'm at the office, as you can see, mm -hmm. and most of my team is. Uh, the team has the option uh, should they want to work from home, they, they could. Uh, should they want to come to the office, they could. But I think the majority of us have realized it is much more efficient, frankly, to work, uh, especially if you're groups, to at least have an, some sort of an in-person interaction. It doesn't need to be on a daily basis. You, we don't have office hours and what have you. Like, this is not the case, never was. We're outcome-oriented as, as a culture. And uh, teamwork is important to us and we work collaboratively. So a hybrid model that includes physical meetings and, and physical interaction, I think will continue to be core in, in our operating model. We will never, I, never is a big word, but I don't see us transitioning into a full-time uh, work from home model, uh, at least not me, that's for sure. Dr. Hamadeh, and I would insist on the doctor because it is well deserved. Thank you so much. It was very uh, insightful on, on two sectors that are very, very important for, for our region uh, and for the startup ecosystem. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. Thanks a lot.